Well, good morning. Um, today we're going to talk about uh, a story you might be familiar with. We're talking about Jesus going into the desert and being tempted. Uh, you might have, I remember being in Sunday school and we used to have this board that was covered with green flannel and we had the little figurine that had the little flannel background and I have distinct memories of Satan and Jesus and a wall and the teachers acting it out. So it might be a familiar Sunday school story to you, but we're going to talk about it in a slightly different way. Um, so, sorry, pardon me. There's a bunch of, I'm just going to make sure my cords are not going to trip me up. Uh, but the text we're going to look at is found in Luke 4, and that's important because we'll see some of the context around that text, before it and after it, uh, come into play in how we can read this text. But before we get to the actual text in Luke, I want to tell you another story. So when I was 21, I was walking through the Fish Creek Library. That's that triangle white building down by South Center. And to be honest, 21 was uh, not my favorite time in my life. I was pretty lonely. I was pretty confused, just finishing up university. And during this time, I actually wandered public libraries a lot in town. I went there to read. And on this day, I was leaving the library, and I saw, um, you know, how they have the stacks of books, and sometimes they have at the top just books they've pulled out to highlight. And out of the corner of my eye as I was passing by, I saw a book called The Man Born to be King by Dorothy Sayers. I think it might be the next slide. That's the exact um, book jacket that, I, that caught my eye. Now, I did not have a clue who Dorothy Sayers was at that time, but something about this book captured me. I took it home and I read the whole thing over one weekend. Um, and it made, me, it made me cry. It made me have a reaction to it in that kind of good, relieved sort of way. Because in, in this book, I found a description of Jesus being human, uh, and that was a big revelation for me at that time. I quickly devoured everything else Dorothy Sayers ever wrote, and I learned about her fascinating life, and the more I learned, the more she's become one of my favorite authors. Uh, there was a, and then later on in my life, when I was in grad school, there was a seminar on Dorothy Sayers' writings, and I was first in line, excited to read more and learn more all about her. So, quick little bio of her, just because it's interesting. She was born in 1893 in England, a daughter of a country uh, pastor. But she was one, she was very smart. She, she was learning Latin and French and Italian by the age of seven, eight, nine, ten. She was in, in that world. And she was one of the very first classes of women scholars to be accepted into Oxford. Um, and she graduated as one of the first classes. So, and even when she graduated, so they, were, they allowed the women to do all the work of an undergraduate degree in Oxford, but they weren't actually allowed to claim their degree um, until about five years after she finished. It wasn't legal. So she finished in 1915. She became finally an Oxford grad in 1920. So one of my favorite stories about her during that time was, I guess she was in her dining room. They have the dining room when you live at Oxford, and she was in there, and she chose to wear these huge parrots in um, golden cages earrings and she got kicked out which it's this has nothing to do with my sermon other than I love that fact about her <laughs> she oh, I want to wear these earrings and she got kicked out by it but she's probably most famous for she wrote the Lord Peter Whimsy detective novels um, in the 20s and 30s and they were popular and there's been BBC um, uh, adaptations of them throughout the, the next generations. But she also paid her bills by working in an ad agency. So you might have seen these um, old 1940s Guinness ads, and those were her creations. So they usually have, there's one that says, um, it has a toucan on it and a bottle of Guinness, and that was hers, or one that says, my goodness, my Guinness. And you see them, I have a bunch of um, magnets with them on them. That was Dorothy Sayers who created those. Um, she was also, oops. Sorry, I'm losing my place here. She was a friend and contemporary of uh, J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis and Charles Williams. Um, she wrote letters to G.K. Chesterton, but I don't know if they were really great friends, but she was part of C.S. Lewis and Tolkien's writing club called The Inkling. She was the unofficial member, and there they would share um, stories, they would share their art with each other, they'd write something, give it to each other to read and get feedback on. They talked about being um, Christians, they talked about being artists. And one of her greatest passions in life was to bring to life the Christian story, which I think for a lot of Christendom at that time, especially in England where she was, it had just become very regular. 
very boring, maybe. And she wrote about the Gospels. She was quite taken with what she actually read in the Gospels. Um, And in one of her essays, she wrote, So that is the outline of the official story, the talk of the time when God was the underdog and got beaten, when he submitted to the conditions he had laid down and became a man, like the men he had made. And the men he had made broke him and killed him. And as if she hadn't already made her point, she continued, this is the dogma that we find so dull, this terrifying drama of which God is the victim and the hero. So there was something about the Christian story, something about the incarnation of Jesus that really captured her and said, we need to be paying attention here. So this, Dorothy Sayers, is the person that wrote this book that caught my attention when I was 21. And this book, The Man Born to be King, it's a collection of actually 12 radio plays. So in England at the time, it was illegal to represent any person of the Trinity on a stage. So you couldn't have a play about God if God was being acted out by anyone. But you could technically have a radio play, and so that's what she did. She wrote it for the BBC in the 40s, and it it transmitted kind of throughout the 40s over um, during the war. This play would go out on the BBC. And this book, The Man Born to be King, is actually what C.S. Lewis wrote, read every Lent season after that and until his death. He would read it every year. He wrote Sayers' letters thanking her for this work. And in these plays, she takes the events of the Gospels and she dramatizes them. She uses you know, the vernacular and the accents of the British people at the time to kind of give life and incarnate, if you will, th- these old stories. And she does that in a way that really kind of places you right in the story. So I thought it'd be cool uh, if we could listen to how she treated the scripture we're going to look at today in her plays. I'm going to read how she kind of sets up and gives context to that temptation story. Um, and then we'll get into the text itself and see what's happening and where we might be invited into the story. So you can follow along on the screen. Um, I've just written out, I just wrote out the, the text from the excerpt, or the excerpt of the text of this part of the play. So we start um, with Jesus, with a couple of his new disciples, and some more are kind of gathering around him. And Jesus says to Simon, sit down, have supper with us. Simon, well, thank you very much. Mind you, I'm as keen as anybody to see Judea restored to her rights. I've listened to John Baptist, and it's what I call good religious talk. But I can't stop at talk, and excuse my blunt way of putting it, There have been so many people starting movements and claiming to be the Messiah, but never came to anything. Andrew, well, they all broke against the power of Rome. And see here, Master, we've got to face the fact that it's a pretty big thing for a handful of common folk to set themselves up against the empire. I mean, Simon and I are just fishermen. And so are those sons of Zebedee. John Baptist's got a good following, and I'm sure a lot of them would be ready to follow you. John Evangelist, well, surely you only have to speak, and the world would follow you. Jesus, I can offer you no proof. I can only say, here I am, believe in me. Simon, the moment I set eyes on you, I could see that you were one to be trusted, but the people will look for a leader who can improve their living conditions, and you can't blame them. And the priests, Andrew, the priests, they won't touch politics. They're hand in glove with the government, I'm afraid. And if the angel Gabriel himself was to come flying straight down out of heaven, they'd have him arrested by the temple police for causing a disturbance. Simon, it's Rome that's the obstacle, first and last. They don't mean Judea to be independent, and they'll listen to nothing except armed force. Jesus. Children, children, you don't know whose voice, with whose voice you are speaking. Appetite, superstition, force, none of these things can bring in the kingdom. It's God's kingdom we're looking for. Listen, try to understand. When I came to John for baptism and heard God call me his son, I went into the desert to fast and pray. And when after 40 days I came out from the presence of God, I realized that I was hungry. And in the same moment, I knew I was not alone. John Evangelist, were you visited by an angel? Andrew, John Baptist often sees vision when he's fasted. Jesus, well, something spoke in me that was not myself and said, why go hungry? If you are the son of God, if indeed you are the son of God, you have only to command and these desert stones will be turned into bread. And I knew it was true. I had only to command. It's easy to feed the body and starve the soul. It says in the scriptures, man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. I spoke the words and the temptation was gone with no more than a shudder of the flesh. But that other was still with me and we stood together on the topmost pinnacle of the temple, looking down into the streets of Jerusalem. Andrew, do you mean you were really there? Jesus, well, we seem to be really there. And that self that was not myself said to me, if you are the son of God, 
if indeed you are the son of God, throw yourself down. Well, you can't be killed. Doesn't it say in the scriptures that God's angels will hold you and keep you from harm? Far below, I could see the priests and the worshipers assembling for the evening sacrifice. And that whisper came again, prove to them what you are. Prove it. Are you quite sure of yourself, son of God? Prove it to yourself. John Evangelist. Dear master, have you felt that? That doubt that shakes a man's reason? The fear that the blessed truth may be a lie after all? And Jesus, I said to that other, it is written, thou shalt not put God to the proof. He must be trusted as a father and a friend. And the terror in my mind passed away. Andrew, was that the end? Jesus, not yet. <laughs> he took me into a very high mountain and showed me the whole world unrolled at my feet like a map. Byzantium and Jerusalem with all the cities of the Mediterranean, city upon city with all their power and glory. And he said, son of God, if you indeed are the son of God, I will give you all of these for your own if you will serve me and do homage for them to me. And then I knew him for what he was, and I spoke his name. You are Satan the destroyer. Away with you, for it is written, Thou shalt serve the Lord thy God and do homage to him alone. And when he saw that I knew him, he fled, and God sent his angels to strengthen me. Simon. Master, if I understand you right, there's no way by which a man may win power and not become corrupted. But if it's as you say, how is the kingdom to be restored? Jesus, I'll tell you what the kingdom is like. You've watched your wife making bread. She takes a little piece of yeast and she stirs it into a mass of dough. She sets it aside and the buried yeast begins to work in silence and unseen till the heavy lump rises and swells and becomes light and ready for baking. That is how the kingdom will come. Like that? Just like that. Are you disappointed? I thought it would come with armies and banners and a big procession into Jerusalem. Well, you may yet see the Messiah riding into Jerusalem. Well, we rather expected signs and wonders and that sort of thing. You will see signs and wonders, but you won't believe because you've seen wonders. You'll see wonders because you've believed. And what I love about Sayers, that's just a little script, and she's done the whole Gospels in that sort of way. What I love about what she's done is how she's woven it all together, the, dis the disciples um, questioning and learning about who Jesus was and what he was about, but also unlearning and unlearning their own identity who, and learning about who they really are. So with this picture in mind, I like having that image in mind of Jesus talking with his disciples in a regular sort of way. Let's look at the text in Luke 4 and its context. So it's been noted by a lot of commentators that this temptation passage in Luke 4 is smack dab between the baptism of Jesus and the first sermon he gave, or the first sermon recorded that he gave. And that context is important in Luke. So in Luke 3, Jesus is led to John the Baptist where he's baptized and God ordains him. And he doesn't ordain him with a mission, he ordains him with his identity, right? So in Luke 3, when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And he, as he was praying, heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And the voice came from heaven, you are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. So that's on one side of the baptism story. And then on the other side, in Luke 4, verse 14, we read, Jesus then returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, and he, where he had been brought up, and he went on the Sabbath day. He went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up and read, stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back, and sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So we have the Spirit proclaiming Jesus to be God's beloved Son, and then we have Jesus being led by the Spirit to start his ministry by proclaiming good news to the poor. And smack dab in the middle of those two stories is the temptation story. And if we're joining in with Jesus in his identity as a beloved child, and in his mission of proclaiming good news, um, then this story in the middle, we got to kind of pay attention to. In Luke 4, it says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, 
have you noticed he's been full of the Holy Spirit every step of this way in these stories? Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. And the devil said to him, If you're the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered, It's written, Man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil led him to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, Well, I'll give you all their authority and splendor. It's been given to me. I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will be yours. And Jesus answered, It's written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. For it's written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered, well, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had finished all his tempting, he left him for a more opportune time. So we have Jesus, the beloved son, being led into the wilderness a wild place, an untamed place, maybe a place that's not comfort or colored by our comfort or our ease. And also, as I think about it, it's the wilderness is a place where we don't need to protect our comfort and our ease. It's not there. The desert is a place where we're not left with a lot of external reassurances or resources. We kind of have to find our own solid ground. So Jesus is led there, and he spends time there, and when he's good and hungry and vulnerable, he is tempted. He's hungry, the devil says, oh, if you're who are you say you are, turn this stone into a loaf of bread. That will solve your issue. You can't do anything worthwhile if you're hungry. And he's tempted with this one. If you are who you say you are, the goal is to have authority over all these kingdoms, right? To have the authority to make the changes you want. I'll give that to you if you just worship me. And he's tempted with this. If you're so beloved, if you're bringing in this kingdom, throw yourself off this height. God command, is commanded that he'll save you. Prove it. Prove it to everyone. Prove it to yourself that you are as loved and as important and as about God's kingdom as you say you are. And at every turn, Jesus rebuffs these temptations. No, no, no. And he does them with the Hebrew scriptures, but more pointedly, because the devil's using the scriptures too, right? It's not just the fact of the scriptures. He's rebuffing these temptations with a knowledge of who God is, the character of God revealed in those scriptures. So Jesus, after spending time in that wilderness, has an interior sense of who God is and who he is. None of those temptations are actually evil things, if you'll notice. Feeding yourself and wanting to eat, that's not evil. (laughs) That's a human thing. That's a good thing. Wanting God to be there to catch you, wanting to trust that God is there to catch you and provide and secure you, that's important. That's not evil. That's a human thing. And the longing for the ability and the capacity to make the world better, also not an evil thing. That is a good thing. But the temptation presented to Jesus is to warp those good things, and the temptation is to obtain them the wrong way, the way that does not trust who God has said he is, and more specifically doesn't trust God's way of doing things. I've been thinking about this a lot, and I was thinking if the signature move of God in this passage, this whole Luke passage, is to ordain us, proclaim over us our beloved identity. And if the signature message of God is this clear-sighted freedom from oppression, the, the poor are being lifted up, and that's the message of God that the good news is here in Jesus, then the signature move of an enemy to that would be to tempt us away from that identity and away from that mission. And he does it so sneakily by saying yes to the good thing but offering it in a way that's not God's ways. Uh, Eugene Peterson writes, Jesus as the truth gets far more attention than Jesus as the way. Jesus as the way is the most frequently evaded metaphor among Christians I work with. But way comes first. We cannot skip the way of Jesus in our hurry to get to the truth of Jesus. The ways of Jesus is the way that we practice and come to understand the truth of Jesus, living Jesus in our homes, our workplaces, friends, and family. Remember Dorothy Sayers has those disciples saying, asking about the kingdom, and Jesus saying, it's actually like yeast. It's actually something hidden and unseen, but working and effective. They wanted power, and he gave them yeast. That's the Jesus way. And I was thinking, this is a question I'm, I'm asking myself all the time as I navigate 
social media and listening to the news and listening to political talk and even situations that come up in my family or school climates. What's the Jesus truth I'm standing up for? And what are we making, are, and are we attempting to make a Jesus truth a reality in a way that's not the Jesus way? And that's something I'm asking myself and I'm pausing for reflection here. I love um, in the plays of Dorothy Sayers is that she portrays that tension really well. The tension of Jesus' disciples um, desiring the kingdom, but thinking you got that kingdom in ways that aren't God's. And you can see this especially in how she describes the character of Judas in the, in, throughout the plays, um, the follower of Jesus who ultimately betrayed him. She writes, <clears throat> Judas cannot have been the creeping, crawling, patently worthless villain that some people would like to make him out to be. Because she reasons that if he had been obviously a bad guy, obviously evil, well, Jesus wouldn't have chosen him. Nor would Jesus have chosen an obviously bad guy to just fulfill the role of betraying him. That's not quite within the character of Jesus either. And she wonders, I wonder if Judas must have started out as a good guy with good intentions to bring the kingdom, to follow Jesus to this kingdom. But he got tempted to do it a different way. And when he saw Jesus was not doing it the way he thought, well, maybe he thought the priests and leaders were the way to go. In Judas's case, we see him giving up on the Jesus way and betraying him and thinking that this way of power was the one, the way that yielded the truth. Sayers goes on, the most damnable of all sins is a subtler one than crude ambition or crude greed or crude lust. The worst evil in the world is brought about by deadly corruption of good, good virtues, the sins that try to bring about God's kingdom by ways that aren't his. I find this understanding of Judas paired with the Jesus temptation story really challenging because it's so easy to find, it's easy for me to find a villain out there without kind of having to look inside. And it's one thing to avoid outer temptation, and it's quite another to avoid the temptation to take matters into your own hands, to sacrifice God's ways of grace and patience and dealing with real people right in front of you in order to accomplish some idealized goal. And if there's something the enemy would wa not want us to see, I think it might be the self-emptying way, this way that trusts love over power, the cross way of Jesus, is the way to the truth of Jesus. Remember that conversation Jesus had in those plays? Appetite, superstition, force, none of those things can bring the kingdom. It's God's kingdom we're looking for. But we thought there'd be banners and armies, and we thought we'd see you march on Jerusalem, and the disciples were confused. We thought we'd see the one who'd bring God's kingdom march in with power and might. We thought you'd fulfill all our hunger. We thought we'd have a movement to go to. We thought we could follow the truth without much being changed in here by what happens along in that Jesus way, what happens in that desert time. Jesus was shaped by that time in the wilderness, a time with not a lot of comfort, with not a lot to defend, and it shaped him into something that saw God's ways a little bit more clearly. And it was then that he was able to walk into that synagogue and proclaim, the spirit of the Lord is on me to proclaim good news. So the story, uh, when I read these stories that I think we might be invited to, is one where we're living out our identity not by forcing God's truth or by forcing others into God's truth, but by letting ourselves be led by the Spirit, even into places where all our comfort and our ease are stripped away, where the ways we make sense of the world, the ways we thought were good are taken away and we're kind of left a little bit vulnerable, maybe a lot vulnerable, we're left a little bit bare, and I think it's in those places where we're presented with that choice, that temptation to bring surety back to ourselves by procuring power however we do it, or comfort or certainty, to make God and others fit in our safe, predictable, manageable understandings. Or the other choice would be to lean into and onto the identity that God's given us as his beloved children and lean into his character of unfolding love of growing from within love and that self-emptying cross kind of love. What a story this story is to start the, uh, all the events of Jesus' life. And what a way for us to have to jump into his story, 
to be faced with wilderness. There's a few different places you might be in as you hear those stories, or if you take this and you go home and you read those stories again and again. As we've read it, some of us might be in this place where we are hearing again or for the first time, God pronouncing, oh, there he is, my beloved, or there she is, my beloved. Look at her, oh, I love her, wow. And you might be in that place in the story, and that's good. And yet some of us also may have been at the other place in the story, we're being led into a desert, a place of desert, where the ways we made sense of the world and our family, the ways we kind of had our own identity, especially maybe our faith identities pegged, they've been taken away for some reason or another. And we're a bit vulnerable. Maybe we're a bit confused. Maybe we're hungry and we just need some answers. Or some of us might even be in the, other, in the next part of that story where we've experienced that desert, that loss of meaning and clarity, but something of the character of a good God and not our ability to force things to happen, that's what led us through. And maybe some of us are in this place of being commissioned to talk about the good news and to proclaim uh, freedom to the oppressed and the year of the Lord's favor. Maybe some of us are in that place right now. And I, wherever you are, I pray you're encouraged by the story of Jesus's and that these three events go together baptism and wilderness, and the proclamation. We don't live out God's good mission without going into that desert first. And we don't make it through that desert first without hearing that we are beloved and we are his kids and he loves us. So take that, take it over and read it. Read those three stories. Read it a few times over your week in different spaces and see what comes up for you. Uh, See what challenges you, what you don't like about those stories. Maybe open that up to God. Uh, One last encouragement uh, that this story and Dorothy Sayers revisiting some of this has brought up for me. For me, one of my own many deserts (laughs) I've been in through, but by far the biggest and the hardest and the one that's probably shaped my life the most was in that time in my early 20s when I literally stumbled across that book. I was very lonely and very confused. um, And that's because I think I was in a period of my life where I did not know who I was or where I belonged. I had had to leave a church that had been given me my identity for years and years and years. And I'd had to leave because some bad things happened at that church. And all the ways of my making meaning in my life, of my making sense of who I was, who God was, what we're doing in this world, it was taken away. Um, And I, like many people, you experience a depression after that and you kind of get into this place where you do not know what steps to next take. And in the midst of that time, that's still pretty painful to think about, in the very middle of that time, God, who calls us beloved, called me beloved. And he gave me books. He gave me that book to reaffirm his words to me. Literally, so that's not the only book that came across my path like that. Literally, one time, a book literally was just in the middle of the floor. I picked it up, and it was something I needed to hear. (laughs) Like... There were so many times I just was passing by books and I picked one off and thought, maybe this is it. But literally God brought book after book after book, knowing the way to my heart. He knows the way to speak to each of us and he affirmed who he was in that wilderness space for me. He showed me his character. He didn't tell me to double down on my certainty and to procure some way of making life better. He just showed his kindness and I was truly changed in that time. I went from relying on my own ability to make sense of God in the world um, to knowing that by far the hardest and greatest thing I was always going to be asked to was to let go and just to trust God. And he was there. And I wonder if it's from only that place of coming through those deserts that any of us can really stand and talk about God proclaiming good news. So if this is your story, uh, know that it's a good story It's a good story, and know that what's hard and scary in the desert, it's not without the presence of God. And know that knowing the character of God is key to discerning where you are and to discerning what's going on in those times. Know that he's ordained you to be his beloved, and then he's ordained you to join his way of love and grace and wholeness over fear and idealism and certainty. Know it's a story always ready to shape us 
and he's asking us to jump into it. And that's where we are this morning.